Hi guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all doing well and that you've had a great week. The kids are back at school, so if you'll notice, there is quiet in my house for once. And you'll notice that I'm back in the living room now, guys. I love filming in the living room. I just like the way the light is better and that I can see things more, I guess, just in case Lola needs to go out or anything. But hopefully this works for you guys too. Uh, if you're new to this channel, like I said, my name is Crystal and I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist from time to time. I do international crimes as well, specifically uh, to show the differences in the judicial system, cases that are recommended to me or cases that I find really interesting and want to share. So if that sounds like something that you guys are excited about or want to know more about, hopefully you guys will hit that old like button. Hopefully you will subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the notification bell. Leave me some comments and share these videos if you want to, guys. If you do choose to leave comments, please no hate, though. There's enough hate out in the world as there is, guys. We don't need to add to any of it. We're just here to talk about things. That's all. Um, so if that sounds like something you guys want to get behind, hopefully you guys will. I'll be really happy to share this with you every week or when I can do it. <laughs> Sometimes it's not every week. You guys know how it goes. If you guys are returning subscribers, I just want to once again, thank you so much for letting me come into your lives when you guys have the time and the opportunity. I know I talk a lot, but Hopefully you guys are getting good information from this and that you guys are enjoying me. So I just want you guys to know how much I love you and how thankful I am that you guys chose to listen to me. It's, it's makes me really happy guys. So thank you. It brightens up my day. And you guys already know that for YouTube, these videos are for entertainment or educational purposes only. So we'll get that out of the way. Now I realized guys, that we actually hadn't talked about a female killer in quite some time. I knew we did Carla Hamoka, uh, and that was a lot. I know we also talked about Eileen Wernos. The only other female that we talked about was Jane Hirschman, and that is a case of self-defense to me. I don't consider her a killer. Most people don't either. That was self-defense. We know that Billy was something out there. So if you guys do want to um, watch those videos, I do have them. But while I was preparing for the Mark Twitchell case that we just covered for the past couple weeks, I figured our next step should be, we should probably check out a female killer in Canada. And I came on a doozy, guys. Um, I don't recall hearing about this woman before. Uh, I may have. She comes, she has a lot of different names. And she is pretty astounding, guys. The case, beep, beep, it takes some twists and turns. So we're going to get right into it. Melissa Ann Shepard. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of her. Maybe you've heard of one of her aliases, aka Millie. She likes to be known as Millie, not Melissa. AKA the Internet Black Widow. AKA Melissa Ann Russell. AKA Melissa Ann Weeks. AKA Melissa Ann Stewart. And AKA Melissa Ann Friedrich. So she goes by a lot of different names, guys. Uh, I am not certain what her maiden last name is. I don't know anything at all about her family, guys. There was very little talked about when it came to her early years. What I do know is that she was born on May 16th of 1935 in the small community of Burnt Church, New Brunswick. Burnt Church is basically, um, a, it comprises of two uh, reserves, guys. These are reserves that are headed by the Mi'kmaq First Nations. And basically, they call Burnt Church, um, I'm going to butcher it, I'm really sorry, guys, uh, as Geno Peticha, which means a lookout. It only has a population of about 1,715 people, guys. It's very, very small. And the reason it is called Burnt Church is because of the Seven Years' War between the French and the British to decide who had ownership over the over Canada and this was at the end of the 1700s guys I think it was like 1795 and the British sent in a true or in one of their colonels and told him to destroy anything that was Acadian made anything that was French so he did exactly that including burning the first stone church that was ever built in New Brunswick. That's that's why it's called Burnt Church. 
Um, at some point in time in 1953, when Millie was 18, she relocated to Ontario. I think it was the Toronto area, guys. Um, some reports say that she moved here with her family. Other reports say that she moved here to stay with an aunt and finish high school. But regardless, at that point in time, she did relocate to Ontario. In 1955, she met a man named Russell Shepard. And Russell Shepard would become Millie's first wife. They got married that year. Millie was 20. I think Russell was the same age as her. Once again, I don't know a lot about him either. Uh, he, was, he was said to have been a factory worker. The two did get married and they did have two children. It doesn't appear like Millie ever worked at all, like at all in her whole life, guys. I'm not even sure what she graduated with, um, what her specialty was. I know she finished high school, guys, but I, I don't know what she even enjoyed doing or what she ever thought of doing. As far as I know, um, she was a homemaker at this point in time and it was Russell that was actually um, supporting the family. Everything was fine, guys, for 22 years. For 22 years, everything was fine until 1977. At this point in time, Millie is 42 years old and between 1977 and 1985, for whatever reason, Millie started racking up charges and convictions. These would be like things for fraud, impersonation, forgery, and littering. She was racking up the charges and it wasn't just in Ontario guys um, because they charged her in Toronto, Ontario, but it was also in, George, in Georgetown, Prince Edward Island. So she was getting charges from there too. Whatever happened, if this was a midlife crisis, if it was empty nest syndrome, if they had to do it for necessity, uh, I don't think Russell lost his job, but maybe he had to decrease his hours. Maybe he got sick. Maybe... And it seems more likely that Millie had been doing this for years and 1977 was the first time she was caught. But regardless, she racked up the 30 plus charges. Uh, in 1985, because of all this char these charges, she was actually sentenced to five years in prison for her various fraudulent activities. However, Luck was always on Millie's side, guys, and you will see this in this video. She was able to get out of jail on parole in December of 1985. Though being sentenced to five years, she was released in December of 85. So one thing to know about Millie is that she is super, super charming and very manipulative. She can get anybody to do anything for her. And she has a way of charming everybody, including the court systems. And I think a lot of it has to do with her age. But we're going to get into that. Um, a journalist who wrote for The Guardian named Barb McKenna, who had done at least one article on Millie, said that she could, quote, charm the bark off a tree, end quote. So this charm and manipulation seems to work for Millie and it lets her escape from harsh charges, let's just say. Because Millie in her golden years decided that she was going to have a different criminal career, one that was much more dangerous. In 1988, while she's still married to Russell, I think the two of them are separated at this point in time, but legally they are still married. She meets a man named Gordon Stewart and the two of them have an affair, so to speak. But like I said, I'm pretty sure that she's separated from Russell. She was 53, or sorry, yes, Gordon, their names, trust me. She was 53 and Gordon was 41, around 41 at that point in time. He was an actually a fairly recent widow, guys. And he was selling some property on PEI. That's how they met. So the two of them got married in 1990 in Vegas. They then later got married in another ceremony in Vancouver, British Columbia. She never lived there, but they got married again there. Even though at this point in time, she's still legally married to her first husband. Um, their relationship was described as very tumultuous. It seemed to be a lot of fighting. I know at some points the fighting turned physical. I don't know if it went both ways or if it was just Gordon. But 
we'll get into that. Trust me. On December 23rd of 1990, Gordon was admitted to the hospital. Um, he had been disoriented most of that day and he had become delusional. And I'm guessing it was Millie found him on the kitchen floor frothing from the mouth. So she called an ambulance and they took him to the hospital. Toxicology was done because of course this, it appears like he's being poisoned, right? Or he's ingested poison or something of that extent. So they did some toxicology and they found that Gordon had large levels of benzodiazepines in his blood system. This is a prescription drug that was never prescribed in any way whatsoever to Gordon, but they were in his bloodstream. He, he kind of had a mild overdose. And these were large amounts, not small ones. So benzodiazepines, guys. Um, I, I do want to point out, though, that even though he had come in with apparent overdose symptoms, the hospital never looked into it. No charges were laid. Nobody was suspicious. Nobody was suspicious. I don't know how, but they just weren't. Uh, so benzodiazepines are basically a type of tranquilizer. They're a downer uh, as opposed to amphetamines being an upper, right? So they make you feel calm. They make you feel relaxed. They make you feel sleepy. Um, they're usually prescribed for things like um, insomnia, anxiety, and they are a seizure medication as well. And it's a group of drugs, guys. So Xanax is in there, Valium, Restoril, things of that nature. They're all benzodiazepines. Keep benzodiazepines in mind because Millie does love them. I don't think she ever abused them herself, but she does love them. And you guys know that they can be lethal and that overdoses can occur and addictions can occur from using benzos as well. In March of 1991, Gordon was actually arrested for assaulting Millie. Now, I don't know if there was any other times that he did. Um, there are no uh, hospital records claiming that or saying that Millie showed up claiming any other assault other than this time. Um, there are no records that have her showing up in the ER multiple times with suspicious looking uh, injuries, nothing like that. This is the one and only time that he was arrested for this. I don't know what his previous relationships were like. Remember, this one was described as tumultuous. So I don't know what his relationship with his first wife had been like, if he abused her. I don't know anything about it, guys. So sorry, I can't really help with that. But he was arrested for assaulting Millie. And she may have been used to it. I'm not sure. I, I don't know what her relationship was like with Russell. So regardless, she called police and he was arrested for it. So Gordon at this point, to, oh, I also want you guys to know that benzodiazepines can mimic the signs of dementia in elderly patients. Now we know Russell isn't an elderly man, but is it possible that it could have changed his brain chemistry or changed his chemistry to such an extent that he became violent? I don't know if that's a possibility. Maybe it could have been though. Uh, Gordon did plead guilty to assaulting Millie. And on March 26th of 1991, the judge actually ordered a restraining order issued on Gordon saying that he could have absolutely no contact whatsoever with Millie. Unfortunately for Gordon though, Millie didn't follow this decree, let's just say. In fact, she initiated contact with him several times. And by April, the couple were back together again. So once again, like I said, if Millie was being abused, and there's reasons why I'm saying if, guys, it's not that I don't believe her. Nobody deserves to be abused, not in the least. And we know for sure she was assaulted at least once by Gordon. We don't know the circumstances surrounding it, but she was assaulted at least once by him. Nobody deserves to be abused. However, you're going to, you are going to question certain parts of Millie's story, let's just say. So on April 20th of 1991, the couple actually relocated to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, even though they weren't supposed to have contact with each other, they actually relocated there. They were living together once again as man and wife. And 
I'm believing that they did so as a way to fly under the radar of the police of PEI, right? This would have been breaking one of his parole things. And um, obviously it's a condition. He's not supposed to be with her. But regardless, they relocated to Nova Scotia. So if you don't know about Dartmouth, it is actually part of the, it was amalgamated into Halifax. Um, I think it was in 1996, actually, it was amalgamated into Halifax. It's about a 15 minute ferry ride from Halifax proper. It's also known as the City of Lakes because so many lakes are in the area, in and around the area. And it has about 93,000 people that reside in it. It's known for its water sports, its music, its culture, its art, things of that nature. You guys know um, Dartmouth, when I think of Dartmouth, I do think of the ferry and I do think of a lot of water. So it's well known for its water sports. It's also actually uh, the birthplace of some famous people. Michael Jackson, but not that Michael Jackson, a different one, who actually played Trevor on Trailer Park Boys, as well as John Paul Tremblay and, sorry, I want to get their names right, Rob Wells. I know what their names are on the show. Just didn't memorize their names in real life. Um, they all come, all from Trailer Park Boys, you know, Ricky, Julian, and Trevor. They all come from that area. So Don't Run is pretty well known. Um, one week later, from, from when they moved there, on April 27th of 1991, uh, Melissa called police and told them that her husband was dead and it was at her hands. Apparently, she gave her husband, this is the story... This is not the story she told police, but this is what is now believed to have happened. She gave her husband a cocktail of benzodiazepines, alcohol, and rubbing alcohol. She had him ingest that before driving him out to a remote um, road, a remote rural road uh, near the Halifax airport. And then hauling his more than likely dead body because she gave him a lethal amount of benzos. She, he was more than likely dead at that point in time or almost dead. She dragged him out onto the road and then ran him over twice. Yeah, two times. She then went back home, took three hours to clean up and, and come together with a story or whatever, get rid of the pills before calling police. She waited three hours to call police and tell them what happened. Now, according to Millie, Gordon got super drunk that day and took all these drugs and the rubbing and alcohol himself, then forced her to drive him around all these random roads at knife point before making her go on to this rural road and then forcing her out of the car and either sexually assaulting her, raping her there, or attempting to rape her in the woods at this area. She said that's what happened and that's why she had to kill him because it was just too much. She just, it was just too much. Um, she was charged with the murder of her 44 year old husband at that point in time. Remember, Gordon is only 44 years old. In May of 1991, her divorce from her first husband, Russell, finally comes through. So she's been illegally married to this man for a few months at this point in time. But regardless, she's never charged with bigamy. Never. I don't know why, but she was able to escape that. So she had, she went to trial, of course, and at her 1992 trial, they print the, um, the defense painted a super grim picture of their relationship, talking about how he was an abusive alcoholic that beat her at every chance, things of that nature. Um, they said that, um, Millie had quote, accidentally run over Gordon twice accidentally um because she was quote in a rush to escape end quote after the rape in the woods or the attempted assault in the woods now it is possible that i don't think i can say it enough guys it is possible that he was abusive i really don't know 
We do know that he was arrested for that one time and he did plead guilty of it. So it's possible that he was abusive and that she did run him over as a way of escaping his abuse. But she ran him over twice and they never talked about the drugs in his system or the fact that he had gone to the hospital before displaying overdose type, like displaying overdose type symptoms. They never brought any of that into play. And of course she said that he was the one that drank all the time. I don't know if he was ever described as an alcoholic before he met Millie. I really don't know. Uh, they used, of course, the battered women syndrome. And this is why I brought up Jean Hurt. Um, oh my God, I am having some problems today. Joan, oh my God, I'm really having problems. This is why I brought up Jane Hirschman, guys, because we know that um, battered women's defense was introduced as a form of self-defense because of Jane Hirschman's trial for killing her highly abusive common law partner, Billy Stafford. Millie used the battered women defense and of course she did have that one assault charge against Gordon as a way to to justify killing her husband and she also said well it was an accident that I ran him over she made it seem like it was the running over that killed him and not the drugs I I don't even know why the drugs weren't really brought up in the trial but they weren't she's lucky that's all I can say is this woman is incredibly lucky so basically, as you know, the battered women's defense is where a partner is so beat I, I'm going to say partner because I know it's called battered women's, but this can happen to men too. A partner is so beaten down by their husband or common law partner or boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you. They are so burton, beaten down and the abuse is so continual. They feel that they have no other option but to kill their partner. And it doesn't have to be at a point in time when the partner is actively abusing them. It can just be when they reach that hit, that snapping point. They've been abused, 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 abused so much that they do away with the partner because they feel that is the only way that they can get away from the abuse. And they also feel that this is the only way they can protect themselves and their families. Because we do know that in a lot of cases with abuse, the abuser will try to find the abused. So the battered women's syndrome is a form of self-defense. So a sexual assault was, uh, exam was actually done on Millie, um, on April 27th, and they didn't find any signs of sexual assault whatsoever. Um, there were no contusions, no abrasions, nothing like that. This can happen in cases of rape though, guys. You don't necessarily always see abrasions and telltale marks like that. So it is possible that he could have raped her and just nothing showed up. Uh, however, they also noted that there was no dirt whatsoever on her body or on her clothes, no mud, no branches, no sticks, nothing. Even though she claimed that this had happened out in the woods and the area that she claimed it happened to, a scent dog couldn't pick up either her or Gordon's scent in that area in the woods. There was nothing there that indicated a person had even been there, guys. There were no footprints. There was no scuff marks. There was no movement in the soil or in leaves, nothing like that. No disturbance whatsoever. So be that as it may, I'm just pointing that out. Moreover, in the week before Gordon died, or, or slightly before Gordon died, he wrote a letter. And in the letter, he alleged all the times that Melissa had cheated on him. He, told, he wrote down every lie she ever told him. And he said that she had emptied out his bank account. I don't know how much money was in it, but she, he said that she had emptied out his bank account. So it was almost like he knew something was going to happen and he wanted proof out there to show what type of person Millie was. Regardless, Crown, the Crown prosecutors actually believed that Millie had killed her husband because she wanted his pension benefits, his CPP benefits. And uh, concocted the rape story and the abuse stories to get out of to get him out of the way, so to speak, and also to avoid charges. The judge then told the jury before they deliberated that if they believed Millie had intended to kill Gordon that day, that they needed to come back 
with a verdict of second degree murder, not first degree murder, even though it appears to be premeditated, particularly because of the drug overdose symptoms. And she technically killed him twice over by running him over and drugging him. But regardless, they said second degree, which of course, you know, means, um, the best way to describe it is basically it's more heat of the moment, guys. You didn't necessarily mean to kill that person that day. You did take the instrument to kill them or you did kill them, but you didn't necessarily mean to. It's not premeditated or not as premeditated. It's more split second. I didn't mean to, but it happened. It's, it's a lesser amount of guilt than first degree and a lesser amount of premeditation. Um, he then, okay. He then, the judge then, want, then went on to say, I'm sorry, this is really astounding, that if the jury believed that she ran this man over twice, I might add, and apparently ignore all the, the drugs in the system, and that they believed that she accidentally hit him on her way to leaving the, on her way from leaving the scene, getting out of there, and if they believed it was accidental in nature, then they needed to come back with a verdict of manslaughter. The jury came back with a verdict of manslaughter. I don't know how you could look overlook the benzodiazepines that basically said he was dead before he hit the ground. But anyway, they did. So at 57 years old, she was sentenced to six years in prison. And this would be on April, uh, sorry, August 20th of 1992. So six years in prison, 57 years old. Just putting that out there. Now she was um, transferred to Kingston Penitentiary here in, Ont here in Ontario at that point in time to serve out her sentence. If you guys don't know about Kingston Pen, it's actually, or it was, built in June 1st of, of 1835. And it was one of the oldest prisons in continuous use in the world, guys. Uh, Kingston actually closed down in September of 2013 because it needed so many repairs, guys. It was it was in pretty pretty large disrepair, and we had Mill Millhaven at that point in time. Um, Kingston was a maximum security prison, but it does have smaller satellite prisons that are minimum and medium security and it housed both men and women um it housed some of canada's most high profile offenders most high profile cases stephen truscott was held there of course we know he didn't do anything but he was held in King, uh, kingston pen so was colonel russell williams Paul Bernardo, of course, was there. Carla Homoka was there for a short time. Um, Michael Rafferty was there. Clifford Olson was there. A lot of high-profile offenders were sent to Kingston Penitentiary. It's a museum now, guys, and it does do tours, if you guys are interested in going to see it. So Millie was actually a model prisoner during her time at Kingston. She did a couple good things. Uh, number one, she set up a support group for women that had been in abusive situations. So this lends credence to her story that she was abused, but you do have to keep in mind that she's a very good liar, guys. She did, regardless, she did set up the support group for people that had inmates, female inmates, that had been in, in abusive relationships. And she also had a starring role in the National Film Board of Canada's documentary, When Women Kill. I believed it was filmed in 92 and 93, and it was actually um, released in 1994. And Melissa is one of the key women that they interview for this documentary. So it seems like she's trying to turn her life around. I mean, she's 60 at this point in time, so why not? But regardless, 59, 60, she's getting up there. Luckily for Millie, somehow she was able to get parole in 1994. She was paroled, full parole in 1994. So she served like a year and a half for killing her husband. However, everybody believed it was an accident. Everybody believed it was self-defense, even though it can't be both, but regardless. So not one to let the grass grow under her feet for long. Millie decided to embark on a different path. And for a while, she was actually a national spokesperson 
um, in Canada for battered women's syndrome, um, based on what she said had occurred um, in her relationship with Gordon. And she toured the country giving speeches and doing appearances, um, things of that nature on battered women's syndrome, as well as giving talks about killing and self-defense. Uh, she was actually given a government grant at this point in time, too, in order to help other women um, in abusive situations. She was given a government grant. God only knows what she did with it, but she was given a government grant to put forward programs for abused women. Uh, she also sued journalist Barb McKenna at this point in time for that negative article as well. In May of 1996, Millie set up a toll-free hotline and it's a counseling hotline for women inmates who are having problems while in jail, problems within the jail system. She did that as well. It's called Project, or it was called Project Second Chance. So it does appear that Millie at this point in time is turning her life around. However, it wouldn't take long for Millie to find herself in trouble again, mostly because she's lonely and broke. Uh, when she left Kingston, she didn't have any money, or so she said. God only knows what she did with the money she plundered from everybody else's accounts. But that was what was said. In April of 2000, Millie went to a Christian retreat here in Ontario. I, I guess she found God. She didn't seem to be particularly religious before, but whatever. And it was there she either met or got a look at a man named Robert Edmund Friedrich. He was 83 years old at this time, and Millie was 66. Um, I don't know if they had like a long conversation or anything during that initial appearance, during the initial time they met. They said met, but some, some articles said that she just saw him. Other ones tried to say she met him on a Christian dating website, but not she's not into internet dating yet. Um, regardless, she saw him, she liked what he saw, Apparently she liked his age. So she wrote him a letter. Um, he's from America, guys. He actually lives in Florida, in Bradentown, Florida. You guys might know that from 90 Day Fiance. Nicole was from Bradenton, or from Bradenton. So she wrote him a letter in Bradenton telling her all about himself. And in this letter, she said, quote, God wants us to be married, end quote. She also enclosed a picture. And apparently... Robert liked what he saw because he invited her to come for a visit in May of 2000. He sent her a letter and invited her to come down and she took a plane immediately. Within three days of meeting, the two of them were engaged. They were engaged within three days. She's really not one to let the grass grow beneath her feet. Of course, in Robert's defense, he's 83. He, he's a recent widower. His wife um, of 53 years had just died the year before of breast cancer. So maybe he's thinking this is his second chance. And he's also lonely. On June 23rd of 2000, so just a little bit over a month after meeting, mm -hmm, the two of them got married in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. I guess at least this time she's not committing bigamy. Um, at an interfaith wedding chapel. They then went back to Florida and that's where they resided. So over the next two years, Robert's family started to notice changes in Robert. And Robert has two grown sons and they described their father as fairly healthy before. I think the only thing he ever suffered from was high cholesterol, but nothing, nothing really deadly. He didn't have any diseases. He didn't have arthritis even. He didn't have anything that was really detrimental to his health other than high cholesterol. He was in good shape for an 83 year old man. He was in fairly good shape. He was fairly fit, everything else. But his family members and friends started to notice his health taking a downturn in the two years he was with Melissa. Um, he, they noticed his speech was getting slurred. He'd appear disoriented at times. Um, he was increasingly unwell and he had very frequent hospital visits. This was for a man that hardly had ever been in the hospital before. Now he's frequently going to the hospitals. So his sons are starting to get fairly concerned. They also noticed at this point in time that Melissa didn't seem to have any money. 
and that it was Robert that was paying for everything, including their really long honeymoon. So on May 28th of 2001, Melissa got two prescriptions from two different doctors for lorazepam, which is, of course, a benzodiazepine. Um, records show, police records actually show, that she got the drugs from one doctor and within 30 days, and, and got them filled, and within 30 days, she had another doctor write her a, a prescription for lorazepam, which she then filled. So she stopped piling pills, and records indicate she did this at least six times. And this is called doctor shopping, right? It's a form of fraud, and she had done this at least six times. I don't know if she's addicted to them, though, guys. Like, it would seem like she is. Like, why else does she need them? Well, you guys know why else she needs them, but... It's just very odd, very odd. I wonder what excuse she gave. She probably said she was insomniac, maybe anxiety. So at some point in the early to mid 2000s, uh, 2002, in early to mid 2002, Robert changed his will. She was after him for a short period of time to do this and he made her the sole beneficiary of everything, leaving out his two sons and anybody else. He said that Millie had sole entitlement to his whole entire estate. After, after he agreed to do this, Millie actually called his two sons and left a voice message saying, quote, I have something to share with you this morning. Your father is going to change his will. You guys are getting nothing, a big fat zero. So try that on for size and have a nice day, end quote. She actually said that to his sons. In July of 2002, one of Robert's sons, who's also named Robert, so we're just gonna call him Bob. Bob actually called the elder abuse hotline and reported Millie. He said that he believed she was um, intentionally making his father unwell. Sadly, on December 16th of 2002, after about two and a half years of marriage, Robert died. He's about 85 at this time, guys, 85, 86. And they said his cause of death was cardiac arrest. This was a man that only had high cholesterol. He didn't have heart disease or anything like that. And yet he died of cardiac arrest. I know you can have a heart attack and your heart not be, um, and, and not have symptoms or anything like that beforehand, but it just highly suspicious. Now, because Millie had power over everything, no autopsy was done. No toxicology, of course, could be done. And he was cremated very, very fast. That's what she said he wanted. So that's what was done. People are very suspicious. Police were very suspicious. Very suspicious death of a normally healthy man who suddenly ends up getting really unwell after meeting this woman. And they know about her, her husband before too, right? Diazepam. So, or, um, sorry, uh, benzodiazepines. And also they know about um, her son's reporting to the elder abuse hotline. So police are very suspicious, but because there is no autopsy, there was no toxicology, no reports done of any kind, they can't lay charges for murder or attempted murder or anything like that. Not attempted murder, the man's dead. They can't lay murder charges or anything of that nature. I do want you guys to know, and I'm not quite sure how this is even possible, but she, got the medical examiner to declare her husband dead of cardiac arrest over the phone without ever seeing his body. So I have no idea how she was able to get a doctor to do that, but it was done. So police in Manatee County knew she had been up to something and they knew they couldn't charge her with murder because obviously there's no proof of it. So they decided that charges should be laid for something else. Um, and they began an investigation in September of 2003 on six counts of prescription fraud. This was between March 1st, 2001 and December 1st, 2002 for getting multiple uh, doctors or at least two different doctors to prescribe her the same medication twice. Um, and they said she did this at least six times. So one doctor prescribed her lorazepam. She went and got another doctor to prescribe the same thing. And then she filled both prescriptions at once. This is what she was doing. Doctor shopping. It's fraud. At this point in time, and this was for lorazepam specifically, 
Um, I want to re remind you guys too that um, benzos do cause, they mimic the symptoms, not cause, they mimic the symptoms of dementia in elderly patients. So it's possible that that's something that could have happened to Robert as well. Maybe that's why he was so forgetful and um, disoriented and delusional. At this point in time though, um, Millie decided to go back to Prince Edward Island. So legally she's living in Prince Edward Island, but she's going back and forth between the United States and Canada a whole lot at this point in time as well. Um, she continued to collect on Robert's Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. I always thought it was Social Security Income, but I guess it's Supplemental Security in Income. It's kind of like CPP here in the state, or in Canada. You know, if you're over the age of 65 and you've worked, you pay into CPP. It's um, a retirement plan, so to speak. Canadian pension plan. And over the age of 65, you then get that money returned to you through monthly benefits, so to speak. It's also disability. It's where our disability or federal disability comes from. Um, CPP is a route for that as well. So technically speaking, like CPP, SSI is supposed to be cut off as soon as that person's dead, right? That last month. So the month of December, he would have been paid for but in January and all subsequent months, he shouldn't be receiving checks. It's Millie's, it's on Millie actually to call uh, the government and tell them, hey, my husband's dead. She just never did that. So she just kept collecting on his checks, even though he's dead and he shouldn't be getting checks. In January of 2004, Human Resources De uh, Development Canada started to investigate Millie for crimes related to CPP, or old age pension. Um, this was between the years of 2000 and 2003. However, they did go back further after that too. But originally, it was the years 2000, 2003. Why, you might be asking? Because she had actually applied for pension benefits from CPP and the Department of um, the Human Resources Department on husband number two, Gordon. After Gordon was dead, she applied for his CPP benefits in his name. So she's getting checks for that as well. Um, I think it was in his name. Now, she may have said that she was a dependent of his because they do have survivor's benefits. So I'm not fully aware of that. However, she killed him. And even though it was manslaughter, I don't know if you can get survivor's benefits for that. Plus, he was not even of age to, to apply for pension, right? Um, unless he declared disability, but he's dead. I guess death is a disability, but at the same point in time, he was only 44 when he died. So he wouldn't have had access as of yet. Regardless, they're looking into her for that. And once again, anything that he was receiving from the government should have been stopped after his death as well. So Robert's son did, sons did actually file a criminal complaint against Millie. Of course they can't make charges, murder charges stick, but they can do a civil or criminal complaint against her, alleging that their father died um, by an overdose of prescription drugs at her hands. That's what they said. But of course, no charges could be laid because there was no proof. Um, they also alleged that, she, that uh, Millie siphoned off $400,000 of his money from his accounts. I think it was particularly his savings account. In two and a half years, she siphoned off $400,000 of his. No one knows where this money went. She never really lived a lavish lifestyle, so no one really knows where this money went. But her, um, his sons were able to get back at least $15,000 of it. They were able to recover that. So even though Millie is under two separate investigations and people suspect that she murdered her third husband and know that she murdered her second husband, in two different nations and she's got all of these other fraud charges that she'd had prior nothing's really happening she's not getting any hard charges guys she's being charged with little things that require a few years in jail but nothing like murder or attempted murder like she should be charged with 
Everything's coming up Millie, guys. At this point in time, everything's coming up Millie. Uh, she had actually found another way to meet lonely men because, of course, Millie's still very lonely at this point in time. You guessed it, the internet. So much like Mark Twitchell setting up his accounts. His were fake female accounts so that he could date people on Plenty of Fish. Although he did also use the internet to actually date people on Plenty of Fish. Remember, he met Jess that way, his first wife. Second wife. I think he met his first wife that way too. There's a lot of wives. She decided she could meet lonely men through the internet, through internet dating websites at this point in time. I'll give it to her, guys. She's in her late 60s and, and she's navigating the internet. So I'm going to give it to her. I mean... She probably navigated the internet better than I did. So by September of 2004, Millie was talking to at least, or was contacting at least 20 men in Canada and the United States through internet websites, um, dating websites. She was able to do this. Just waiting for the right one to come along, guys. She was just waiting until she liked the sounds of everything. By that time, things were coming up for Millie because the American fraud charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. I still don't understand that. They had the actual doctors. They had the dates. They had when the prescriptions were filled. They had that it was multiple doctors. But regardless, the charges were once again dropped. Everything's on Millie's side. I'm telling you, luck is on her side. In October of 2004, the RCMP actually visited her home in PEI as part of their investigation. So she still had that, but the American case was over. By early November of 2004, Millie had met a new man named Alex Strategos on AmericanSinglesDating.com. She met him there and they started to talk. She seemed like, or he seemed like the best candidate, let's say. Alex was 73 and diabetic, but much like Robert, other than the diabetes, he was in really good physical shape. Millie at this point in time was 69. So Alex was divorced, but he was um, an accountant originally from Pittsburgh. However, he had settled in Pinellas Park, Florida at this point in time. Um, on November 5th, they had their first date and she moved in that night. So they had their first date and then Millie promptly moved in. Oddly enough, that first night, Alex showed up to the emergency room with a head injury. It had occurred after his new lady friend had served him some ice cream, which she frequently would after dinner during their time together. This visit would become the first of eight visits during their two month relationship. Eight hospital visits, two months, guys. In December, on December 28th of 2004, so they've known each other for approximately a month and a half at this point in time. Well, during another hospitalization, Alex actually signed over his power of attorney to Millie. She now has access to his accounts as well, but she has access over his life too. Uh, Alex's immediate um, relatives are growing highly suspicious at this point in time. Thankfully, he does have children around him, um, kind of like Robert, and they are getting suspicious. Gordon, it doesn't appear having children, so maybe there was nothing to be anybody to be suspicious of. Or maybe they just didn't have contact with him. I don't know. They didn't suspect anything if he did have children. But in Robert's case and in Alex's case, his families, their families got concerned fairly fast. So in January of 2005, Alex's son, Dean, was finally able to see his father's medical records and toxicology tests, his blood tests. Um, he happened to be visiting the hospital during one of Alex's frequent now hospitalizations and he was wondering what was up so he actually read through this stuff and he sees unprescribed benzodiazepines were found in Alex's system in his blood tests and we're not talking small amounts we're talking large amounts not enough to be lethal at that point but large amounts of them nonetheless he also was able to find out that $18,000 had been siphoned off from Alex's accounts um what Millie was doing was siphoning the funds from her, from his accounts in small, smaller increments and then putting them directly into her own accounts. 
Lucky for us, Dean acted fast. Lucky for Alex, Dean acted fast and he contacted police. Once again, due to lack of evidence, it couldn't be proven that Millie was the one giving Alex the benzos. And it couldn't be proven because it could also be assumed that somehow at 73 years old, Alex decided that he wanted to become hooked on benzos and somehow got them illegally and took them himself. That, that was an allegation. Even though Millie has a, a history of having said prescriptions and has had two, <laughs> two dead husbands, one who was drugged with benzos, but that nobody really paid attention to. But anyway, of course, no toxicology was done for Robert. But regardless, they, they knew. Instead, Pinellas County, or sorry, Pinellas Park Police decided they were going to charge her with something. They really did want to charge her with something at this point in time. So they charged her with exploitation of an elderly person and forgery, saying that she had coerced Alex into signing over the power of attorney. And this does make sense. I mean, $18,000 is, is gone. And she did take advantage of him. So Millie accepted in March of 2005, Millie accepted a plea deal. Once again, another plea deal in this case. Um, this time it was for the lesser charges of ga uh, grand theft, fraud, and also forgery. She received five years. The couple was only together for like two months. I can't believe this. Just, wow, she did a lot of damage in two months. Alex was lucky to be alive and survive his relationship with the internet black widow. That's another name that's attributed to her. He believes that she was poisoning him with the benzos or overdosing him with the benzos by pouring them on his ice cream, by like tainting his ice cream with them and then giving him the ice cream at night because they frequently ate it after dinner. So she could kill him and he assumes she wanted to kill him for his money. But once again, she escaped serious charges. So things were not super great for Millie at this point in time. I mean, they were better than they could be, though. Uh, Nova Scotia RCMP had actually issued an arrest warrant for Millie on February 1st of 2005. They do know that she's involved in legal proceedings in the States, though. So they figured, I guess when she was done there. They could probably charge her in Canada. Um, she was finally being charged with defrauding the Canadian government of... $30,000, $30,348.54. And this was across a four-year period. They now alleged it was um, from 99 to 03. And this was, of course, stemming from the fraudulent CPP tax. However, on April 2nd of 2009, these charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. You guys guessed it. Um Millie had even more luck because just two days later on April 4th of 2009, it's 2009 that this occurred um, because of course she served the five years, right? So on April 4th of 2009, she was paroled from American prison and promptly deported back to Canada. She decided she was going to settle into a senior's retirement apartment in Nova Scotia. You'd think that's where the story ended, guys, but if you thought that, you'd be wrong. And this is what Millie looks like. Just in case you guys were wondering, she looks like anybody's grandma. Like, it's kind of, that's scary. She looks harmless, but she's not. Uh, she has done what now? She has killed two husbands, more than likely by poisoning each of them. Um, and she's also done things to a paramour, a boyfriend at this point in time. If, if you weren't suspicious before, you should be. So Millie was 77 years old in 2012 when she met 75-year-old Fred Weeks. Um, they lived in the same retirement. I, I'm calling it a retirement complex, but I guess it's like a seniors complex. It's not assisted living or anything. It's just a place where older people go. Oh, apparently Dart Dartmouth, Nova Scotia is also a place where people like to retire. It's a retirement resort. There you go. But they're not there, of course. Um... Actually, they may have been in Nova Scotia. So never to, wet, to let the grass grow under her feet. She was very lonely. So she just walked up to Fred's door one day, knocked on the door and, and met him. Fred himself was also very lonely. He was um, as well recently widowed. And the two of them decided to give it a go. They decided to start a relationship. And 
yeah, this was early September of 2012. And by September 25th, the two of them were, you guessed it, legally married. Um, maybe they just felt that they didn't have any time to waste because they're both in the golden years of their lives. But regardless, they're married. Now, George Magenny was a justice of the peace, and he's the one that actually performed the wedding ceremony between Fred and Millie. He was really suspicious. Though he performed the ceremony, he had actually watched the Fifth Estate. Yeah, that's right. Pimping at my CBC, Fifth Estate. Um, episode on Millie called The Widow's Web. If you guys want to watch it, it's called The Widow's Web. He'd seen it and he actually called the police and said that he was concerned about Fred. He wanted them to be able to intercept um, the ferry. Uh, I guess the couple was on their way to honeymoon in Newfoundland and he wanted um, police to intercept the them on their way to the ferry and tell Fred what type of person Millie was. Uh, police declined to do so. Um, at this point in time, nothing's happened. So, I mean, they can't really do much about it. They should have. All they had to do was look up Millie's name in the system, and it would have shown that she'd been in prison in the States. Uh, the various fraud charges, the impersonation charges, it would have shown that she was being investigated for the doctor shopping, but those charges have been dropped, that she had previously been investigated for CPP fraud. It would have shown that she had killed her second husband in self-defense. It would have shown a lot of things, but they didn't do that. So even though they were supposed to go to Newfoundland, guys, I, I don't completely understand this, but even though they were supposed to go to Newfoundland, the couple checked it, uh, checked into the Chambers Guest House in North Sydney, Nova Scotia on September 28th of 2012. Um, Millie told the innkeeper that the ferry ride over to um, the inn, it's a bed and breakfast, uh, was particularly rough and that her husband Fred wasn't feeling well. So they went up to their room. Later on that night, the innkeeper heard a loud bang coming from their room. And to her, it sounded like somebody had fallen out of bed. So she went upstairs and knocked on the door, but Millie told them everything was, or Millie told her everything was fine, not to worry, everything was going good. The next morning, Millie called the innkeeper and told her that she needed an ambulance um, because her husband would have to go to the hospital. Uh, she wanted the ambulance sent after she finished breakfast. So the innkeeper, of course, called the ambulance and ambulance and police, uh, who also come, of course, uh, found, Fred we found Fred weak and disoriented on the bedroom floor. He, they ascertained he more than likely had fallen out of bed the night before and she was probably just waiting for him to die. But of course he didn't. Um, anyway, on September 30th, Fred's son called police. He reported that the observant hospital staff, the hospital staff were very suspicious of Millie at this point in time, had told him that his new stepmother had insisted that Fred had dementia, which we know that benzodiazepines can mimic in elderly patients, but she insisted he had dementia, even though he never had it before, and that she had also told them that he didn't have any children, so to relay any information to her, despite the fact that the hospital staff knew he had a son and he also had a daughter. Uh, hospital staff also reported that it looked like Fred had been injected with something when he came to the hospital. Um, Fred's son told the police that prior to meeting Millie, all that Fred had suffered from was high cholesterol. Remember, we talked about that. Nothing, not dementia, nothing of that nature. So police charged Millie with attempted murder, finally, and administering a noxious thing. It was really weird. I thought, I thought it was miswritten. I'm like, oh, they must mean noxious substance. But no, it was actually administering a noxious thing. Um, they found that, quote, doctors found him heavily drugged the result it was later found of melissa spiking his coffee with tranquilizers end quote when police asked neighbors about the relationship between fred and millie or about millie or sorry or about fred uh they were told that millie had told the neighbors fred had no children he suffered from dementia 
from chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease and that he'd suffer and that he'd had several heart attacks, none of which was true. He never had any of those things. Setting herself up there, I guess. So luckily, due to the fast-acting hospital staff and the police, Fred survived. Thankfully, Fred survived. Tests showed that he had been heavily dosed with benzos in his system. Um, they found heavy, heavy, heavy doses of them. Not necessarily lethal. It's almost like, you know, arsenic and old lace. Like, when people used to poison people in ye old days with arsenic, you know, like Jane Toppin or Marianne Cotton, even Janine Jones when she was using, um, I think it was heparin, things of that nature. When they start poisoning people, it's over a period of time and then bam, a big dosage on the last day. Stuff like that. So she's following the script, I guess. Um... They found that he had heavy um, doses of benzodiazepines in his system, despite not having them prescribed to him and never taking them. However, at this point in time, Millie didn't have the time to go home and clean up like she had before. Remember, she waited three hours before calling police after killing the first husband. Um, and after killing the second husband and the third husband, she just was able to make it look like cardiac arrest, I guess. Well, she got that doctor. God only knows what she promised him. Or maybe he was just a really bad doctor, I don't know, to, to say it was cardiac arrest and had him cremated before anything. But police were actually able to search their house in Nova Scotia at this point in time and found 144 lorazepam pills, um, a small quantity of tamazepam, three empty unlabeled bottles of some type of drug. They had no idea what it was um, because they were unlabeled. Um, and prescriptions for benzodiazepines from not one, not two, but this time five different doctors in the area. They also found several sets of identities in her possession. Several sets of identities. Um, they also confiscated a, sus a suspicious looking tub of ice cream. <laughs> they did. <laughs> So luck once again, though, on Millie's side. I don't know how she was able to do it. It's probably her age. She's like in her 70s. Nobody wants to believe that a 70 plus year old woman is out there killing husbands. I don't know. And because she's like, she looks so innocent, right? She looks like grandma and she's so good at charming people and manipulating people. She was able to get the charges reduced to from attempted murder and administering a noxious thing to only administering a noxious thing and failing to provide the necessity of life. She pled guilty to these charges on June 10th, 2013 and received a three and a half year sentence. Now you'd think that's where we were done, but we're not. Fred says that he remembers little of what happened between the ferry ride, or sorry, of little of what happened between the wedding and when he woke up in the hospital. He doesn't even remember if they took a ferry. They may not have. That might have just been a story she concocted. Um, he did have a piece of luck, though, because oddly enough, Millie put down fake information on herself on the marriage license and the marriage documents that they applied for. So because this was fraudulent, their marriage was declared invalid. So they were never really married. Millie was released actually from prison March 18th of 2016. She had some very heavy conditions placed on her. I believe there were 22 of them in total, including that she had to report any new relationship with a man to the police. Um, she was banned from having any and all contact with the internet. She couldn't use the internet. She couldn't assess the internet at all for the rest of her life, her life. And that any attempt she made to alter her appearance would have to be photographed by the police. And then several other conditions too. So police from Halifax actually issued a media release after Millie was released saying that she was a high risk offender who was now residing in the community and that she was at high risk for reoffending again. Um, within a month of her release, Millie was actually caught by an officer surfing the internet 
at a library in Halifax. Um, she also had a device, quote, capable of assessing the internet, end quote, on her person as well. This, of course, was a breach of the terms of her um, conditions, the conditions that they placed on her after she was released from prison. And, but she pled not guilty to this. And because she's ever so lucky, and she was 81 years old at the time, Charges stemming from this incident were dropped December 22nd of 2016. That's why I'm like, oh my God, she's so good at, at manipulating the system. I have no idea how she's able to do this. So Alex, her second victim, or her second last victim, I should say, her lover that, that was smart enough not to marry her, said, has said of the 86-year-old Melissa Ann Shepard, quote, what she was, she still is. She's the black widow. Widow. Some guys better watch out. That's all I can say, end quote. So that's it, guys. That's the story of Melissa and whatever we want to call her. Melissa and Shepard, Frederick, Russell, Weeks. Take your pick, I guess, guys. That is her story. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm astounded that this woman at this age is in her 70s was still going around killing people and in her 80s was still assessing the internet and trying to date people. I'm just, I'm astounded. I'm astounded that she didn't start her career until she was 42 years of age. And that was when they started catching her for things. But she didn't start killing husbands until she was in her 50s. Insane. I just, you gotta wonder what had happened to her. So what do you guys think? What do you think happened to Millie? What made her go over the edge? Um, it could have been one of a number of personality disorders. I'm a, you know me guys, I'm always looking for the, why someone would act that way. It's not always psychopathy. It's not always narcissism. Of course, we're going to say psychopathy because she's charming and she's manipulative and she's able to get people to do what she wants. But there are a couple of other things that she could be. So we know that she could be a psychopath, lying, cheating, compulsive lying, especially the charm, the manipulation, all of that stuff. But if she was showing signs of psychopathy, you would think that somebody had noticed it when she was younger. And she does appear to, well, you know what? I can't even say she appears to care for her kids because you never hear about them ever again. It doesn't seem like they were visiting her or anything. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's possible that she could have psychopathy. She's very good at what she does. Um, she could be an antisocial personality, guys, which is the pattern of disregard and violations of the rights of others. She repeatedly did this by stealing, lying, and killing! So though she didn't seem super aggressive or destructive of property, she was destroying people's lives and she was destroying their bank accounts. So, I mean, there could be an argument that she could be an antisocial personality. This is also um, something that they feel that um, Carla Mocha had too. Uh, she did kill people. She lied and she swindled and she was aggressive in pursuing relationships. She was aggressive in that respect. She may not have been physically aggressive, but she was aggressive in pursuing things. Uh, she could have been borderline. We talked about borderline personality before, uh, specifically with Eileen Wernos. If you guys want to look into that, she, it's possible she was borderline. Her relationships were very unstable in her head. Um, maybe not particularly the one with Gordon, because it was described as tumultuous. Um, her later relationships after her first husband, I mean, they weren't disastrous, but she did try to kill them. Uh, the only relationship they said that was um, really um, tumultuous was that of Gordon. But she had been married for 22 years, longer, more like 24, uh, 25 maybe, she had been married um, at least together with her first husband for at least 22 plus years. Like, I mean, more than 20 years, guys. And and he never said anything about her being aggressive or psychotic or antisocial, nothing like that. So she was able to have interpersonal relationships. I don't know if she's borderline, but she does have a pattern of, of being very unstable in her own relationships after, <laughs> after her first husband. Uh, she is impulsive. 
Um, that's shown through all the various fraud charges and everything else that she racked up and the impersonation and, and even the littering. She is impulsive. And her methods were calculated enough that she was never charged with murder or, or really, I mean, even if she was a char even if she was initially charged with murder or attempted murder, she was able to make sure the charges never sticked or never stuck due to lack of evidence. Sorry guys. She could be a histrionic personality. Uh, she loves attention. She doesn't appear to like men very much, but maybe this was a way of getting back at her ex-husband. I, I, I really don't know guys. Um, she lapped, I mean, she, for a few years after getting out of prison, you know, in the early to mid nineties, mid nineties, she was okay because the attention was on her, you know, she was doing the tours and the promotions and the speeches for the use of battered women's syndrome. That could have been a way of her getting attention. She always described herself as lonely without a man, or she was always described as being lonely and that's why she needed to be in relationships. So it does look like she craves some type of attention. Maybe she felt her husbands weren't giving her enough attention. Maybe money to her was attention. I don't know. So it's possible she could be histronic. Um, she doesn't seem to make too much of a scene about things though. You know what I mean? Like not sitting there and throwing herself around constantly, but she was in the spotlight for a few years in the mid nineties. I'm just pointing that out guys. So that could have been a reason why she didn't kill as fast after she killed her second husband. Uh, she could be narcissistic, like we said before. She has a need for admiration. Using her abuse story to become a national spokesperson could be true. It might not be. I'm just saying. Um, plus the documentary, it seems like she likes the spotlight, right? She does have a lack of empathy and look at everything she did to her victims. She didn't care. It's possible Gordon really did victimize her. And it could be like Eileen Wernos, where she swore that that first man, Richard Mallory, raped her. It could be like that. Maybe her second husband did abuse her and it caused something to snap in her. And so she subsequently suck at, or, um, sucked the financial life out of people. But so she subsequently sought out other men like that. I don't really know. Um, I mean, she has to believe. She I, Look at the nasty message too that she left for Robert's son. Sons. I mean, she has to believe at this point in time she's better than people because she, she's you know, gotten one over on the system several times. She skirted many, many charges, guys, but who can say for sure? What do you guys think? Melissa Ann Week or Melissa Ann Weeks, Melissa Ann Frederick, Melissa, Melissa Ann Russell, Melissa Ann Stewart, Melissa Ann Shepard, whatever way you want to call her. What do you guys think? What do you guys think she is? Why do you think she started killing? Why do you think she started killing so late in life? And do you think she's still a risk? I for one believe she is, but do you think she still is? Let me know what you think down below. I hope you guys have a good week and I will see you next time. Bye for now.